Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, let's play the imagination game. Please try to find out an answer for the next question. If you will have the possibility to change something in the Android development, what will it be that thing? Do you have something in mind? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> maybe the way to handle the life cycle of the UI components, or maybe the way to update the UI when uh, something is changing your database, or even the way to handle an SQLite database in the Android development. Google addressed the same question to the Android developers, and they got also an interesting answer. One of the developers said that he doesn't want to deal with the technical things. What do you mean by that? What technical things? You are a developer? Uh, he specified that he just wants to deliver the project. And his explanation was related to the fact that sometimes uh, we have a lot of tasks to f be finished, a lot of issues that should be solved, and you don't have enough time in order to make a detailed research about a specific topic. In that moment, you just want to finish the project and move on. I don't know if this is the best approach, but this was his point of view. If you will take a closer look on the way to handle an SQLite database in Android, uh, we will find the, this documentation page related to the SQLite Open Helper class. We could manage an SQLite class by uh, using this, by extending this class. And inside of it, we will, not, we will need to define a lot of constants for the database version, for the database name, for all the tables that we should define, and also for all the fields that should be uh, created, all the columns of those tables. Other than that, we need to create the table. And after the table was created, we need to insert the data inside of it. And finally, we will get the data. And you write this code, a lot of code, and you just want to run your app and see if it works. And your app will crash because you just forgot to add a comma. So what are the main uh, SQLite challenges? We have a lot of boilerplate code. We have SQL queries checked at runtime. We have database operations on the main thread. And also, we have unmaintainable and untestable code. As an answer to these things that should be improved in the Android development, at Google I.O. 2017, Google launched architecture components. These are more a set of guidelines that could help us, the developers, to create better apps. At Google I.O. this year, architecture components are actually part of the Android Jetpack. And the developers were happy again. My presentation will focus on Room, which is an object relational mapping library. Why an ORM? First of all, because of the productivity. When you are using an ORM, we write less code. We just define the models, and the tool is responsible to generate the code for us. Other than that, we have also an application design as a main advantage of an ORM. When you are using an ORM, uh, the code, uh, the, uh, the concerns are, are really well separated, and you are able to also follow some design patterns. Other than that, another reason that should we use an ORM is the application maintainability. Uh, by using a good ORM tool, you care about less about the code generated by it, by it. It should be well tested, so we just need to focus on adding new elements in our database schema. Also, the developers were the ones that who decided the features that should be included in Roam. They decided to have compile time query verification, because it's important to know that if your query is written correctly or not. So Android Studio will raise a compilation error if something is not correctly created. Other than that, we need to have also migration support, because usually we take care about the user's data, and we want to maintain it across the versions. They didn't want to have a Java Query Builder API. And the reason behind of this is the fact that usually when you are using a Java Query Builder API, the code is not so predictable. So you write an inner join between three or three tables, and when you check again your code in after two or two weeks, you will not understand from the beginning what's happening there. 
Other than that, they also like to have SQL, SQL completion in Android Studio. So the tool will help us to, to write the SQLs. And for sure, since we are using a relational database, we need to have relationships between the entities. Are you ready to start? <laughs> okay, <laughs> I hope yes. <laughs> so first of all, we need to define the dependencies uh, in our Gradle file. At this moment, the current version of Room is 1.1.1, and if you are using Android extension, the current version is 2.0. An, in an interesting thing to mention here is the fact that Room will work only for uh, the minimum SDK 14. So we had defined the dependencies. After that, we need to define the components. We have three types, entity, data access object, and the database. Let's start with entity. Let's say we have a company class. Uh, our company class has three fields, the ID uh, of the company, the name, and the picture. And I would like to save in the database only the first two fields, I mean only the ID and the name. So my table should have this structure where the ID will be the primary key. In order to do that in Room, I will just need to annotate my class with the entity annotation. And uh, inside of it, we could also specify the name of the table that should be created in the database. For each field, we could mention a column info annotation in order to define the name of the column for that table. Since our com company ID will be the primary key of the table, we will annotate with the primary key annotation. And because we don't want to save the picture in the uh, database, we will annotate it with ignore. So our table has this structure. And let's say that I would like to also add a date when the company was inserted in my database. So this field, it's a date type. I will try to use this approach, but do you think it will work in SQLite? No, it will not, because SQLite doesn't support the date type. So we will need to find a way to solve this, this issue. And the best approach for this case is to use an integer type. So, and this for sure will work. So we will uh, try to translate the date to an integer. And Room offers us a type converter. So in our case, we will have two methods. One that will translate the time step to a date, and the, one, uh, the other one that will translate the date to a time step. Uh, this uh, type converter could be applied to a field, uh, and also it could be applied to an entire data access object class or entity or it could be available at the entire database level. Let's go to the DAOs, data access objects. Let's say that I would like to get the data from the, my company table. So in SQLite, I will write something like this, select all from company. Actually, rooms, Room understands the SQL queries, so we could use it directly in our Java or Kotlin code. In our case, the DAO will be actually an annotation added to an interface. In this case, the company DAO interface. And inside of it, we have some methods to query, insert, update, and delete the data. Let's say that by mistake, I was, instead of company, I write companies. In this case, we will get a compilation error that will let us know that uh, the company's table doesn't exist in our database. OK, let's take a closer look to the uh, DAO class. So it's an interface. Let's take this example with department DAO. We have an insert all method inside of it. This class is an interface. So since it's an interface, someone should provide the implementation for it. In our case, Room will provide this implementation. So behind the scenes, Room will create a class that, that will implement our interface. Inside of it, we'll find the private final reference to our database and also the insert all method implemented. Inside of the insert all method, we will get uh, a transaction that is started at, be at the beginning. After that, the uh, data is inserted in the table. We set the transaction successfully, and finally, the transaction is closed. Let's go to the database annotation. Database annotation actually combines the entities and the DAOs. So in our case, uh, we will use the database annotation, with, and inside of it, we will need to specify the entities that should be saved in our database. So in our case, it's the company entity. If we have many entities, we could specify them uh, using a comma. 
Uh, another important thing is that we need to specify also the version of the database. After that, we have a class that actually extends the room database. It's an abstract class. And inside of it, we will need to have some abstract methods in order to uh, have reference to our DAOs. For sure, since it's a database, we need to have an instance of it. In this case, I used a singleton in order to get the instance of our database. And inside of this singleton, we have two possibilities. We could use a database builder or in-memory database. The difference between these two static methods is the fact that in-memory database will not persist the data. So if we will add some changes, some in, we will insert some new fields or some new data, we will update something, those changes will not be persisted in our database. In this case, I use the database builder method. Other than that, we need to specify also the name of the class which is annotated with the database annotation and the name of the file for this database. If you are taking a closer look, you will see that uh, this approach looks similar with retrofit if you have used it until now. <coughs> okay, we define the dependencies, the main components. Let's go to the relations. SQLite is a relational database, so it understands the relations between the entities. But why I use the quotes for the word relations? I, also, I use those quotes because in room, entities cannot contain entities. Since you are using a relational database, SQLite, from an object-oriented language, Java or Kotlin, for sure you have read something about object relational impedance mismatch. This is a fancy way of saying, yeah, it's difficult getting stuff into and out of the database. And usually the purpose of an ORM is to solve this issue or at least to make it easier, the translation between the entities and the uh, Java or Kotlin classes. Room also tries to solve uh, this issue. But let's see why Google decided not to have entities inside of another entities. Let's go back to our company example. Our company has also a CEO. So I would uh, like to add a reference to this uh, employee with special rights in my entity class. So I would like to have a reference of it. After that, uh, I get the requirement that I should display all the companies in a recycle view. So I, I have a recycle view with all the company names in, inside of it. And after that, I get a new requirement that I should display also the name of the director for each company. It looks like a simple task. I will add a new text view. I will set the text company.getdirector.getName, and I'm done with the task. But is, is it OK to do that? Right now, we are trying to run a database operation on the main thread. So even if our query will be very, very fast, the main thread has only 60 milliseconds in order to render the UI and do all the stuff that should be done at that moment. So this is why Google decided not to have entities inside of another entities. OK, but how will we handle the relations? We have three approaches. Let's go back to our example. Uh, our company has two offices, one in San Francisco and another one here in Berlin. The one from here is the headquarter. So I would like to save these two locations in my company table. So I will have a class location with two fields, latitude and longitude, and I would like to insert this data in my table. So in order to do that, Room will help us uh, by having nested objects. And we could achieve this thing by using the embedded annotation. So I will embed these two locations. Uh, at this moment, Room will try to create two columns with the same name because Room will uh, go back and see that location has latitude and longitude. And in this case, for each office, we'll try to create two columns uh, for latitude and two columns for longitude. But this thing is not possible in SQLite, so we need to fix this issue. The solution is to use the prefix. And we will annotate the headquarter location with uh, the prefix HQ. So in this case, we will be able to save all these two locations in my table. So right now, this is the current structure of our table. OK, our company has also employees. So 
uh, it looks like a classical approach for a foreign key. Room also offers support. So we will do this classical thing. We have a relation one to many. So the company ID, the primary key of the company table, will become the foreign key of the employee table. We have also the foreign key annotation. And this foreign key annotation should be used for the entity that contains the foreign key. Inside of it, we will need to define the parent entity, the parent columns, and the child columns. Another way to handle the relationships between the entities in room is to, by using the relation annotation. Let's say that uh, our company has many departments. And I would like to get a list of all the departments from a company using the company ID. But I don't like to connect them using a foreign key. So the solution is to create a POJO and to combine the company entity with a list of departments. So I will embed the company entity, and the list of departments, I will annotate it with relation. An important thing to mention here is that the relation annotation should be used only for a field that it's a list or a set. OK, so we define our POJO, so I would like to use it. In order to be used, we will, use, uh, we will create a DAO class that will query separately the fields in order to get the data that we want. In this case, all the departments from a company. OK, let's move on to the queries. We have four different options. We have insert, update, delete, and query. Insert, update, and delete work similar. Uh, I mean, we could use these methods for one object, a, a list of objects, or a var arcs of objects. Uh, in my case, all the methods have, uh, as a return type, the void. But we could also get a value for each one of them. In case of the insert method, that value will represent actually the new ID that is inserted in the database. And for update and delete, that value will represent actually the number of the rows affected. Let's move on with the to the query. Uh, query will be used with insert, update, delete, and select. I already mentioned that Room supports SQL queries, so we are able to write uh, SQL queries directly in our code. In this example, uh, I have a classical approach, uh, the first one, but we have also observable queries uh, with live data and flowable. So Room offers support for live data and Eric's Java. What are these observable queries? Uh, these observable queries are used when you want to notify the UI about some changes that appeared in our database. So each time something is changed in the database, the UI will be updated accordingly. We have also the opportunity to use the row query when our, we don't know from the beginning how we'll uh, manage the SQL. I mean, we'll know, we will not, don't know from the beginning how the SQL will look. We will need to create it dynamically. So this is the best approach for row query. And also row query could be used in combination with live data. But if we will try to use it in this combination, we need to specify the entity that should be observed. Other than that, if we will try to run a database operation on the main thread, we will get an illegal state exception. So don't try it. Transaction. There are some scenarios when you want to uh, run different operations on the same block. In this case, we could, do the trans we could use the transaction annotation. In my case, I have an insert of a new department, and after that, I just want to delete an oldest one. So I just need to annotate my method with the transaction annotation, and everything will be executed in, in the same block. The transaction annotation could be used also with query. And there are two types of scenarios in which this could be used. The first one is when we have a big amount of data, and we are not sure that this data will fit in uh, the cursor window size, which is about 2 mega. And the second scenario is when uh, we are using a POJO with a relation annotation. Because in, in that scenario, Room will query separately the fields. So in order to make sure that we have a consistent data, we should use the transaction annotation. Uh, an interesting thing to mention is related to the trading part. 
uh, if we are using room 1.0 and you have two different threads, on the first thread you are trying to write something and on the second one you are trying to read something, in room 1.0, these two operations uh, will not be done in the same time. So on the first thread, we will need to write. The second one will wait. And after the write is done, uh, we could also read the data. This was avail available on room 1.0. In room 1.1, we solved that, those, this issue. And uh, at this moment, you could run the best, the, both operations at the same time. So we write and read in the same time. Migration. This is a painful topic sometimes. Um, Room also offers migration support. So let's see what's happening. We have our company table, which has this current structure in version one. And for the next release, we need to add a ref number inside of it. So we'll need to change the database schema. What does it mean to offer migration? It means to keep the data of the user from a version to another one. So to make the migration of the data from, a version, from version one to version two in our case. Uh, if you are using the SQLite approach, SQLite open helper approach, we need, just need to override the on upgrade method, which has three parameters, the database, the old version, and the new version. This is the classical approach. But wait, we are trying to use Room. <coughs> Let's see how we could manage it in Room. In Room, we have the class migration, and we need to override the, on -migr the migrate method. Uh, so this is the Room approach. In our case, we will just need to alter the company table by adding a new column rev number. So this is the migration from one to two. Do you see also it's added here in the constructor? In order to apply this migration, we will use add migrations method inside of the database builder. And if we are having many migrations, we could specify them using a comma. So if we have from one to two to two, three and so on, you could add them with, uh, only by using a comma. Let's see what's happening behind the scenes. Behind the scenes, there is a room master table. And inside of this room master table, we have an identity hash. This identity hash is changed every time our database schema is changed. So based on that, Room will know that we will need to offer or not a migration. So if you will go to see uh, how your database looks uh, by using an explorer, you, you will find also this Room master table. And inside of it, you will find the identity hash. Other than that, we are having the opportunity to export the database schema in our folder in the project. By using this annotation processor option, we will export the JSON file that could be used to see all the versions of our database. So it's a good thing for the new members of the team, and also for us when we forgot what happened in version five, let's say. And another uh, uh, thing is the, that this JSON file is used in order to test the migrations. If we, if we don't provide if we don't provide the migration, we will get also an illegal state exception. In the case when we are not interested to keep the user's data, there are two approaches that could be used. We have the method fallback to destructive migration in the case when you just want you to keep the data and you just want to um, get the latest database schema. So when you want to clear the data, use fallback to destructive migration. There is a second scenario when we have many database versions. Let's say we have seven different database versions. And I want to offer migration support only for the first, first four uh, versions. And for the other ones, I'm not interested to, to keep the data. So uh, to solve this, uh, this feature, we could use fallback to destructive migration from. And inside of it, we should specify the versions of the database that we will not be kept, uh, for which we will not keep the data of the user. So, what are the main room advantages? We have less boilerplate code. We have SQL queries that are checked at compile time. We, have data, we don't have database operations on the main thread. The code is maintainable, and also we have migration support. 
If you have questions, these are the resources. Thank you, and thank you, Sean. Yes, please. One question, can you query partial objects? In your examples, you always have query star and get the full DAO out of it. Can you just yes. request company name, for instance? Yes, exactly. You could use it, and you just add two points and specify the name of the parameter, okay. and that parameter will be used in your method. But uh, I will get back the whole DAO. It's just not filled. Or can I specify You could combine them, exactly like in SQLite. You could add and, or, inner join, everything you want. Mm. Everything that is available in SQLite is available also in Room. And the result object? Sorry? How is that defined, the result object? I make a query, I select something, I select just company name. Mm -hmm. Do I get back a company object or yeah. do I get back, can I define just an uh, object just containing a string? Usually in this case, uh, when you have many, f co many columns in your table and you yep. just want to get a subset, you should create a POJO. Because mm. a room will, will give you the initial object, or if you are interested to get only a subset of the columns, you could create a POJO and you'll get only those, all, only those columns from your table. Uh, then I can annotate the members with the column name. Yeah, yeah. If it is not necessary to add a column name for uh, annotation, if you define the field and it has the same value like in the database, it will work. If not, and if you prefer to have a name in Java or Kotlin and another name in the database, you should use the column for annotation. Okay, do I have to set the observe entity for that, or? Uh, do, what do you mean, observable query to have the live data for it, or what? Um, yes, if I have live data. If you need it to be updated in the UI, if mm. not, it's not necessary. It depends on what exactly would you like to do with it. Mm. But it will always update when the whole uh, table was updated. Let's say so, if I only select the name, mm -hmm. I'm only interested in yeah. the changes in name, yeah. of course. Yeah. Uh, you, so, uh, actually, live data in Flowball uh, works. Uh, they are notified every time when something is changed in that table. It doesn't know exactly what was changed or it was if it's related to your object that you want mm -hmm. to get. It just lets you know that something was changed in that table. Okay, and then we'll do a whole requery. Yes. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you, too. Any other questions? Um, does Room also offer many-to-many -many relationships? Uh, it's not by default. We just need to follow the same approach. You split the tables. You have one table, uh, those two tables, and a join table that will have that primary key combined from the two primary keys of those two other tables. So I have to create a table in between by myself? Exactly. Okay. A join Thanks. table. Thank you. Hey, uh, you had this example with the bitmap as yes. an attribute, and you said it uh, to ignore. Yes. Um, so you write it, you persist it in the database, but what would you do in this example um, to read it? Because then you would get a null bitmap, right? So we would lose, lose information after persisting it, right? So the idea was if you annotate a uh, field with ignore annotation, that field will not be persisted in your table. But at some Later case, you uh, want to read it from the database, and then the bitmap is null. So you would need to do a migration. Something else. If you, if after that you change your mind and you want to save it also, anyway, it's not a good idea to save a bitmap in the yeah. database. That's a thing <laughs> that I think everybody knows. But let's say you want to save the path of that picture. Okay. okay. So in version one, you had only the name and the ID, and in version two, you have you want also to have the path. So in this case, you should provide the migration. Yeah, okay, makes sense. Thank you, too. Any other questions? I have a question, actually. Um, how, uh, how does Room handle the um, relationship with API and with the database uh, SQLite? With the API? Yes. So, uh, Room is only, it's an ORM for SQLite. So it, speed up the development in terms of SQLite database. So everything that was available in SQLite, it's also available in Room. For the API, you need to use whatever you are using, Retrofit or, when, or what, what else you are using right now, and you get the data from the API and you save it in the database. So there are two different layers. 
this is the offline layer for SQLite, and the API layer is the business logic or what, how you structure the, the classes in your project. Okay, so the API doesn't uh, talk directly to Room. So that would be to the repository and then yes, Room exactly, just with exactly, the repository. Yes, exactly, exactly, okay. exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, since Room manages all the queries internally, uh, or the query function itself, is it injection proof? Uh, I think so, yeah. So if I take your company uh, query, uh, set a new company name, name it, uh, Whatever. Uh, yeah, I, honestly, I didn't try it. drop tables. <laughs> I didn't try it, but I, you could encrypt your data if it's necessary. <laughs> okay. I didn't try it. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, then. Thank you very much.